Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double Elam. Well, I've got no electronic gizmos on the bench here in front of me, so this is definitely not going to be a repair and restoration episode. Instead, I'm going to be investigating modern surface mount transistors to see if I can make a few of them work in the amateur HF frequency range. Let's get started. I really love building my own electronics, especially radio receivers and transmitters. Now most of my projects do start from published schematics created by someone with more electronics know-how than me, but I can't resist the urge to make my own changes, especially when it comes to converting an older design that used through-hole components to use as many modern surface mount components as possible. I also tend to choose projects of intermediate to advanced complexity and choose those that come with detailed function descriptions and notes from the original author. Having some online history from other folks who've built them is also a nice bonus. In the last few years though, this part of my hobby has become increasingly difficult due to one major reason. The transistors that many of these projects were designed around are obsolete. The semiconductor industry, as we know, is constantly adapting to new technologies and churn and consumer demand, and any product that's no longer consumed in mass quantities is likely to be eliminated. Now, small signal amplifiers like the 2N3904 and even a few JFETs have been repackaged in SMT footprints like the SOT23, which makes them a drop-in solution. And hopefully that will continue for at least another decade. Those are still very useful in radio circuits. A bigger problem are the medium power transistors that were packaged in TO39 cases. Now those have completely fallen out of favor and have been abandoned without being repackaged in surface mount footprints, leaving us hobbyists stuck for a solution. There are four TO39s that I'm concerned with here. The first two, the 2N5109 and the 2N3866 are RF transistors. They were used quite frequently in preamps and occasionally as the final amplifier in a QRP rig. You can get a watt or two out of them and you can also use them up to the VHF frequency range. The other two, the 2N2218, 2N2219, are not intended originally to be used as RF amplifiers, but nonetheless, hobbyists have had great success over the years adapting them to work in the amateur HF frequency band. However, now in 2025, all four of those are now obsolete. You can still find new old stock floating around out there, and I did run across one niche manufacturer that's still making the 2219, but be prepared to shell out upwards of $10 a piece for the genuine ones. You can always take a chance on the knockoffs, but they might work or they might not. The solution that I really want here is to find modern surface mount BJTs that are in series production, are likely to stay in series production for several more years, and can be demonstrated to work acceptably in the amateur HF frequency band. Now, I know it's not likely I'm going to find something that's going to work as well as the 5109 and the 3866, but if I can demonstrate performance equivalent to the 2N2218 and 2219, I would still consider that a victory. So that's the scope of this project, and it began with scouring semiconductor manufacturers' websites and lots of data sheets, and then checking the various online distributors to confirm that they actually do stock those parts in reasonable quantities, and also a bit of online consultation. I'm showing here the data sheet properties that were of the most importance to me. First up are the absolute maximums. Any transistor that fell short here was immediately rejected from further consideration. Next is HFE, but honestly, I don't consider that too critical because there's so much variation in it, and many of the amp designs use feedback, which makes it less important. More important are transition frequency and collector to base capacitance. Now these two are key to determining the gain roll-off with frequency, which establishes the device's upper frequency usefulness. The vast majority of modern surface mount BJTs have very low transition frequencies, sometimes as low as 1 MHz, and very high capacitances, sometimes in the hundreds of picofarads. Those that do, <laughs> I immediately rejected from further consideration. So these are the five candidates I've chosen that compare favorably to the four TO92s. Now, no single choice aligns perfectly, but I'm hoping their individual shortcomings don't prevent them from still being useful. And right off the bat, none of them reach the transition frequencies of the 5109 or 3866. 
And I'm not surprised, those were RF transistors, and I'm deliberately avoiding choosing modern RF transistors because of three factors. First, they're usable well into several gigahertz, and trying to use them in the much lower HF band could cause oscillations or other problems with too much gain. Second is cost. They're typically several bucks a piece minimum, if not a lot higher. And third, RF transistors seem to be the absolute worst for longevity. <laughs> they get obsoleted so quickly. So with that said, let's go through the candidates one at a time. First is the 2SC5994 from OnSemi. It's perhaps the best candidate on paper. Next is the 2SCR513 from our Ohm. It also aligns well, and both of them use the SOT89 package, which is very easy to hand solder. Switching now to a larger package, the TO252, we find another R ohm offering, the 2SCR573. It has the highest power dissipation so far, but I am concerned about its capacitance. It's tolerable, but it's still more than double that of the 2218. Candidate number four is the BCP55, back to on semi. It's a SOT223 package, which is in between the SOT89 and the TO252 in size. Performance numbers are about average. And then finally, I chose the DXT2222 from Diodes, Inc. Now, from what I can tell, it looks like it might just be the same die as the TO92 version of a 2N2222 repackaged. Specs are all right, except for power dissipation. It's the lowest of the group. This is a good set, and there likely are more out there that might work, but any future second round of evaluations is going to depend, of course, on the results I get from these first five. And this group also gives me three different SMT footprints to evaluate for heat dissipation, which will not be trivial. Now, more on that later, but first, I need to choose a test circuit for evaluating and comparing all of these transistors. A well-characterized feedback amplifier will work just fine. Section 2.7 of EMRFD provides just what I need, so I'm using this as my master reference for my calculations and design decisions. And as a practical example, there's this amplifier design published by Maquis, amateur call sign SV1 AFN. As I'll show in a moment, it closely adheres to the EMRFD methods. Let's look at some of its features. It's built around the 2N5109. Idle collector current is a robust 55 milliamps, so it's definitely going to have a large Class A operation zone. It's got 14 dB of gain, and that's after 6 dB of attenuation on the output. I'm guessing that pad is there to provide more stability and to absorb more variations in whatever output impedance you happen to connect to it. But giving up 75% of the power to heat is painful, so for a well-behaved 50 ohm load, dumping that attenuator or at least dialing it down to a dB or so would make sense. Time for some calculations. This is a spreadsheet that I created a while back to automate the EMRFD equations. The circuit doesn't match exactly to the Maquis design, but the underlying equations are still in the ballpark. Using the EMRFD formulas, I calculated that these choices of feedback and bias resistors result in a predicted gain of just over 23 dB. That's before the 6 dB output attenuation network, so when you subtract that out, it's still 3 dB more than what he shows. Now maybe his published number is actual performance measured on a finished amp. Maybe it's sandbagged a little bit. <laughs> I just don't know. But at least I'm in the ballpark. Also of interest are the EMRFD calculated input and output impedances. They're very close to 50 ohms and 200 ohms at 7 MHz. The 200 ohms makes sense because of the turns ratio on the output transformer. It's specced at a 2 to 1 turns ratio, which means a 4 to 1 impedance ratio. So 50 ohms on the output side will look like 200 ohms at the collector side. Those EMRFD results gave me confidence to proceed to the next step, LT SPICE simulations. I'll run three categories, input impedance, gain, and gain compression, all versus frequency. My baseline is the 2N5109, and here's what those results look like. Pretty good, and the results at 7 MHz are spot on with the 50 ohms predicted by the EMRFD formulas. Notice how the input impedance falls with increasing frequency. That's expected behavior. So I ran the simulation for each candidate BJT, and here's what the results look like all plotted together. The best candidate that mimics the 2N5109 is the DXT2222, and the worst is the 2SCR573. 
Not surprising because the 573 has the highest COB of the group. All of these SIMs use the same resistor network, so it might be possible to bring the curves up higher by adjusting the resistor values. But that, of course, would alter the gain, which is the next simulation. And here's what the setup and resulting gain curve looks like for the 2N5109. And here's the common plot. All the curves pretty much plateau around 17 dB. Adding 6 dB of the attenuator equals 23 dB, exactly what the EMRFD equations predicted earlier. But why are they almost identical to each other? I think that's because the gain is largely determined by the feedback network, not so much by the individual transistor properties. However, notice that I'm driving the input directly from an AC source without 50 ohms of source impedance. If I had put in the source impedance, then the gain definitely would be affected by each transistor's input impedance. That effect becomes noticeable in the final simulation, gain compression. Once again, I'll start with showing the setup and output results for the 2N5109. Notice here that I am including 50 ohms of source impedance, and my calcs are taken from node sig in, which will let me include the effects of impedance mismatch on the amplifier gain. So here's two plots for the results for all of them. The one on the left is at 7 MHz, the one at the right is at 21 MHz. At 7 MHz, the 5109 has a P1dB of just under 18 dBm, which when you add back in that 6 dB of attenuation, puts it at 24 dBm, which jives with what my key states on his documentation. And notice that all but one of the candidates kept up nicely with the 5109. The laggard is once again the 2SCR573, likely because of its struggle to maintain a 50 ohm input impedance in this circuit. Jumping to 21 MHz, there's a noticeable drop off in predicted gain at this higher frequency. There's also more spread amongst the candidates, and wow, the 573 is really falling off at this frequency. Except for the 2SCR573, these simulation results look really promising that these transistors are going to work just fine in the amateur HF frequency band. But I do need to be a little cautious here, and one phrase that pops in my head is a famous phrase attributed to the statistician George Box. All models are false, but some are useful. So what that bit of wisdom should be telling me here is I'm going to need some empirical data to confirm these modeled results. And in order to do that, the next step is to lay out this circuit in KiCad and fabricate some printed circuit boards. And here's the schematic. My only changes are to insert a couple of test points to make it easier to probe those nodes. Plus I'm showing L1 and C4 as do not include. I'll put footprints for them in the layout, but we'll likely just use a zero ohm jumper for L1 and leave off C4. My spice simulation showed that they have a negligible effect below 30 megahertz. Here's the physical layout for the TO39 version. I spent no time for trying to optimize it for RF performance, mainly because my frequencies of interest are so low. Plus, any compromises in the design would likely affect all the transistors equally anyway. I will need four versions, one for each of the transistor footprints. So here's the version for the SOT89 package. Here's the larger SOT223, and finally the still larger TO252. Notice the prominent pad that these devices sit on. And there are thermal vias to connect that pad to a corresponding pad on the backside. I created this footprint after studying how to best dissipate the heat from these surface mount devices. Let's talk about that heat, and for that I'm going to jump back to the simulation model. I can use it to estimate power dissipation. The transistor dissipates just under a half a watt worst case. All the other resistors, well, they're well below any level of concern, but even a half a watt will need thermal management. One solution might be these cute little heat sinks that come with pressure sensitive adhesive pads. You just stick them on top of the IC and call it a day. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's a crappy solution in my opinion. I just don't trust the adhesive. If it fails, the heat sink falls off and there goes your IC up in smoke. A better approach begins with looking closer at the SMT construction. Now all three of them have an exposed pad. The semiconductor die is bonded right to it. That means there's very little thermal resistance between the two of them, making the exposed pad the best conductor of heat, exactly the design intent. Reference this NXP application note. It shows how adding additional copper foil can greatly increase the heat dissipation of surface mount devices. 
For the SOT 89, even a single square centimeter of extra area on the top copper layer can dissipate over 2 watts. Some caveats though, NXP study used a really thin 0.8 millimeter thick four layer board with solid copper bottom and middle layers. Now that's a lot of copper and not really practical for what I have in mind, but this application note has inspired me. So hence my grand idea, I've designed this custom footprint for a two layer board that's all about heat dissipation. These 10 millimeter by 14 millimeter copper rectangles are placed on both the top and bottom copper layers. I'm using vias in strategic locations to thermally connect them, including several directly under the device's exposed pad. And as a final enhancement, these rectangles are large enough to accommodate those cute little heat sinks. If I do decide to use them, I'll ditch the adhesive and instead attach them to the board with number 3 hardware and some thermal compound. I've got all the components, but the one thing that I don't have yet are the bare boards. They're in transit. But that'll be the subject for the next episode when I build up these amplifiers and test them out and compare them against each other. And hopefully at the end of this effort, I'll find at least one of these transistors will work just fine for use as a low wattage amplifier in the amateur HF frequency band. If you guys do have some additional transistors you'd like me to evaluate and they meet the criteria that I established earlier in this episode, let me know in the comments section below. I do hope you are enjoying this little project that I'm working on and are enjoying the content here on my channel. So, as always, until next time, bye for now.